Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, we're going to get started. Have you guys heard of Poincaré before? We already mentioned him once. Where was that? The Hop, right? Okay. So Poincaré was actually a uh, French guy. I'm not sure exactly. I think early 20th century. Uh, and uh, he um, was one of the first guys who actually thought about staying away from the analytic approach and concentrating more on the geometric approach. Do you guys remember the first few lectures we said something like, ODEs are hard, if you want to really find the actual formula for the solution, good luck, a lot of the times it's going to be really hard. But sometimes you can find out what the solutions look like, even if you don't know what the formula is exactly. Right? What does it converge to? What? How many steady states? What is dynamics? That was this guy. A lot of it was due to him. He actually was thinking of planets. Um, if I understand right, uh, three different planets or two different planets orbiting each other. You're trying to understand the dynamics, and he was trying to say, well, even if we cannot find the formula, let's find out the behavior of it over time. And what he found, to his surprise. Um, and this was already being found out at the time, is that it's very, very hard to find out the dynamics of three different planets orbiting each other. If you have two, you can figure it out, no problem. When you have three, then uh, hell breaks loose. And you can't even, you can, it's, it's, it basically it's the, the beginning of what's called chaotic behavior. This is the first examples of chaotic behavior. Uh, and uh, that's what's called the three-body problem. Okay? Um, when two academics want to uh, how about find, find a job together? That's called a two-body problem. Because it's very hard to find a job in two places at the same time. It comes from there. OK, so poincare Benningson theorem. Uh, so the idea is to study the behavior of two-dimensional systems. What kinds of things can happen in two-dimensional dynamical systems? And to uh, somehow say something about it a priori, like what can happen and what cannot happen. And the first thing you should know is something we have not talked about, and that's the uniqueness or the existence and uniqueness theorem. OK, so suppose that you have a system u prime equals f of, sorry, y prime equals f of y. And you're trying to find out if there is a solution to the system. Suppose that you further constrain and you say, suppose that y of 0 is equal to a. So is there a solution that starts at a and follows the trajectory given by this vector field? Right? We have not talked about it too much. So when do we know that there exists a solution? And even if there is a solution, there could be more than one solution, right? There could be two solutions. I don't know, uh, uh, z of t, that also satisfies the, the equations. Well, what do you think? Is that possible? Is that not possible? As it turns out, as it turns out, uh, if If f is a C2 function, I think you could even get away with, uh, yeah, OK, let's, let's assume C2. Um, the system has unique solutions. for each initial, well, let's say initial, unique solution y of t for each initial condition uh, y of 0 equals a, let's say. So here's a, and there exists a unique solution y of t. Um, uh, small print, the t is not defined on all real numbers. It could be that t is only defined, say, from minus 1 to 1. Can you think of a reason why uh, y is not all defined for all real numbers? For example, it could be that the solution blows up to infinity very fast. That could happen, right? 
solution starts, you know, goes through A and then grows very, very fast and becomes infinitely large after a finite amount of time. That's possible. Okay? So you can actually not guarantee that T is defined for all real numbers. So you can only guarantee that T is on some interval, let's say minus epsilon to epsilon. That's kind of the fine print. The, the, the general idea is you give me an initial condition, you can find a solution that goes through it and it's unique. Okay? All right. Yes, question. Oh, what C2 means? Uh, C2 means uh, twice continuously differentiable. And I'm actually not entirely sure about the C2. I th it might actually be just C1. So basically what it means is that you take the partial derivatives, right? And then you take the partial derivatives of those partial derivatives. So basically any, any two partial derivatives, any second degree partial derivative, and those should be all continuous. That's what C2 means. C21 means all the first order partial derivatives should be continuous. Uh, no, this is a condition on the function f. So this is the condition you start with. You know, you start by assuming that f has that condition, and then you can conclude this for the function y of t. Okay? Uh, all right. Uh, thanks for asking the question. So, okay. So now, in particular, Solutions cannot cross. So now let's think about this situation. Suppose that you have a point A that there were such that there were two solutions that go through A. So let's just have a dynamical system, you know with a point here that has two solutions crossing it. So why is that a problem? Does it violate anything? If we had an initial condition at the point where they cross, then we wouldn't have unique solutions. We'd have two solutions. That's exactly right. You could imagine A, you can set A to be the initial condition of uh, such a system. Right? You set A to be the initial condition of the system and there's only one solution. If, there, if two solutions ever intersected and crossed, there will be two solutions to the same system. Right? So there you go. So no two solutions can cross in dynamical systems, assuming that this condition is satisfied, that the, the, this system is smooth enough. Okay? Um, you know what? I'm pretty sure it's actually C1. I'm sorry, let me... Let me I'm going to leave it at that, but I'm pretty sure it, I'm, I'm, I'm quite, quite, uh, I have an idea that it, it could be actually C1 should be enough. But anyway, okay, so um, let's, just, let's just say what this means. So, for example, if you have in 2D systems, suppose that you have a periodic orbit, okay? Suppose that in, you had a solution that is periodic. So what happens with any solution that starts inside? What do you think? Can the solution ever get out? It cannot get out, right? Because if it ever got out, it would intersect with the other solution, right? So then you start playing this game. You know, you start, you start here, you start following the solution over time. Can it get out? No, right? Can it ever cross itself? No, right? Because then again, you would have two solutions that are going through the same point, right? So no matter what, you have to keep going and keep going without intersecting itself and without getting out of there. There's really not that much you can do, right? There's only so many things that can happen, right? It's, it's, you, know, you, you have to keep going, but you cannot cross. So as you can see, this constrains the dynamics of two-dimensional systems quite a bit. Can you say the same thing about three-dimensional systems? If you have a solution, let's say in three dimensions, you start a solution that looks like, like this, like some kind of ellipse, and then you have an initial condition that starts right in the middle.
can you say that it has to stay within that region? No, right? It can just get out through the side, right? So in three dimensions, that's not a problem. But in two dimensions, right, the fact that there is a periodic solution constrains the dynamics of the system quite a bit. Okay. <clears throat> in fact, we're not get to, we're gonna we're not gonna get to talk about chaotic behavior, but as a matter of fact, two-dimensional systems cannot be chaotic. You cannot have like really weird uh, dynamical behavior going on in two-dimensional systems, but you can have it in three dimensions. And I think that a reason, in, in a sense, boils down to this property: that uh, you know, the, because the solutions cannot cross, you can only have so much complexity in the solution. All right. Okay. So now then. Uh, these guys, Poincaré and ben Bendixson, sat down to think about what it all meant, and they came up with the following theorem, which essentially restricts the possible dynamics of two-dimensional systems. So, let me write this down. So, theorem this is the uh, one way to state the so-called poincaré bendixson theorem. Um, the way that it's uh, written in the book is that suppose f is a C2 function And we're looking at a dynamical system of this form in two dimensions. Okay. Here's a statement. If y of t is a bounded solution, that does not approach steady, uh, any steady states then y of t is either a periodic solution or it approaches a periodic solution. So these are the possible uh, the possible behaviors that can happen. You know, according to this according to this result, this is what it means to approach a steady state. Okay, this is approaching a steady state in the simplest form. So suppose that this is not happening, then you can have either a periodic solution, or you can approach a periodic solution. What does it mean to approach a periodic solution? It means just what we were talking about before. This is approaching a periodic solution. Okay. What other things can happen? Well, there's actually one more um, uh, somewhat pathological behavior uh, that we're not going to consider. Uh, and that is, I think we talked a little bit about this in, um, in uh, when we were talking about dynamical systems that sometimes there are solutions that go, essentially get out from one steady state towards the other. You guys remember this? Okay. You could have one that essentially goes from here to here, one that goes from here to here, one that goes from here to here, and one from here to here. Okay. Uh, this is called a cycle graph. It 
And you could, in principle, have solutions that converge towards such cycle graphs. That is the weirdest behavior that you can see. Essentially, you know, basically it become, gets closer and closer to this thing, so it kind of slows down, and then it kind of misses it and picks up again, and then slows down again, slows down and picks up again, and so on and so forth. Okay? But notice that if it does not approach any steady states, we, have to, we can rule out that condition over there. Because this, these two, this one and that one, will be approaching steady states. So essentially we're ruling out this behavior, and we're ruling out this behavior, so the only behavior that can happen is convergence towards a periodic solution. Does that make sense? I mean, I know it's, it's a little bit abstract, but what do you think? Yes? Okay, so let's look at it again. You have a dynamical system, and you have a bounded solution that does not approach any steady state, okay? So it doesn't get arbitrarily close to a steady state. Then it's either a periodic solution or it converges towards a periodic solution. Okay, now how are we gonna use this in practice? Let's not even think about this cycle graph thing too much because we're going to assume that there are not uh, a lot of uh, steady states out there to begin with, so you cannot have this behavior. <coughs> In practice, the poincare bendixson theorem can be used to prove the existence of periodic solutions. Okay, so it's basically an alternative to the Hopf bifurcation theorem. Do you guys remember the Hopf bifurcation was up to now the only tool we had to prove uh, periodic solutions, right? So the poincare bendixson theorem is another tool. Uh, I would say it's more powerful than the Hopf bifurcation in two dimensions but it is essentially a two-dimensional tool. So when you're looking at five-dimensional systems or three-dimensional systems, as it often happens in biology, then suddenly you cannot use this theorem. Okay? You then you can use the hop. Yes, hop is okay. So the 2D part is important here. Okay. Note. Only works. to the systems. Now, there are actually generalizations for, multi, for higher dimensional systems, uh, but they're very constrained. They assume a lot of assumptions about the interactions. For example, you can talk about cyclic systems where var variable one affects only variable two, variable two affects only variable three, variable three only affects variable one, right? That's a cyclic system. Then you have generalizations of the poincare bendixson theorem. But in general, if you just wanna use it as a general purpose tool, you cannot, okay? And I think it has to do with this, this thing that we were talking about. In two dimensions, having a periodic solution constrains the dynamics of the system quite a bit. In three dimensions, it does not. You have a periodic solution, who cares? You know, you can have to go right through, go wherever, do all kinds of stuff, okay? So that, that, that geometric fact is, I think, what allows for the poincare bendixson theorem to exist. Okay, now how are we going to use the poincare bendixson theorem? So th this, is the, this is now the practical, this is the theoretical result. Now I'm gonna tell you a more practical uh, way to use it. So theorem Let's see. Suppose you can find, or you can construct either one of the following. Suppose that you can construct a bounded Bounded region D with 
with a single repelling steady state and such that solutions cannot leave D. Okay, what do I mean by this? Here's the graph is actually much easier to, to understand than the, than the text. It's a region like this that has a single steady state. So the inside of the region there is only one single steady state. And that steady state is repelling. So for example, an unstable spiral. Okay? Repelling in the sense that if you start nearby, you get away from it. Or an unstable node. And such that the solutions that start near D, that it starts inside of D, cannot leave D. How do you check that in practice? You check the vectors on the boundary of D and make sure that they're all pointing towards the inside. Okay? If the vectors of the vector field are all pointing towards the inside, then the solutions can never, never leave D. You see? All right. <clears throat> now let's go back to the Poincare Benningson theorem. Suppose that you have a solution that is inside of D. Okay? And now let's go back here. Suppose that Y is a bounded solution inside of D, so bounded, that does not approach any steady states. Can a solution that starts over here approach any steady states? No, because there's only one, and that one is repelling, right? So a solution is bounded, okay, because it's inside of this bounded region. It for sure does not approach any steady states because there's only one, and that one is repelling, right? So y of t is either a periodic solution or it approaches a periodic solution. You see? That means that you, you follow it over time, it satisfies the poincare benison theorem, therefore the solution y of t is either a periodic solution itself or it approaches a periodic solution. But that periodic solution has to be inside of D because the solution cannot leave, right? So therefore, there has to be a periodic solution, right? Okay, great. So that's what this theorem is. You construct a region D with this property and then, the, from the from Bunker and Bendix theorem, you have to conclude that there is a, a periodic solution. Or, suppose that you can construct the following set. An annular region D with no steady state and such that solutions cannot leave D. So in this case, the thing to imagine is some kind of two-dimensional donut. Okay. So once again, the solutions cannot leave D. They're pointing towards the inside. But now remember, because this is an annular region, if it ever made it into, into this region over here, it would essentially be leaving D, right? So arrows that are over here has to be pointing towards the inside of D as well. And there cannot be a single steady state in here. Okay, so no steady state. Usually the whole point of creating an annular region is because it's, there's an, a steady state somewhere in here. So we essentially, uh, you know, mark the territory away from that steady state 
to create an annular region that it does not have any steady states. And now we can apply the same story as before. Suppose that you have any solution that uh, starts uh, inside of D, okay? So for sure, it cannot leave D because of the way that it's, uh, that it's set up, right, by assumptions. And the solution has to be bounded. It has to be, uh, it cannot approach any steady state. So this holds. And then YFT is either a priori solution or it approaches a priori solution. So once again, we can conclude that there is a periodic solution in here. Okay, so then, the system must have a periodic Solution. Okay, questions? Nelson, what do you think? It's good. You're good? Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you want to tell me in your own words what we're doing? We're trying to find out if it has a steady state, if it'll uh, stay inside the model. Does that make sense? So, but what is the goal? Like, why are we applying this theorem? What, what do we want to find out about the, about the system? I'm not sure. I think the, the boundaries in there, like, if it, given an initial condition, will it stay inside the given boundary? Yes, but that's an assumption. What, ultimately, what are we trying to do? What, what is the, the, the goal of, of applying this theorem? I'm not sure. Okay, so the goal, you can see it in the conclusion of the theorem the system must have a periodic solution, okay? Ultimately, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find periodic solutions for a dynamical system. And these are all, all sufficient conditions that if we can find out, if we can pull off the construct, we can prove the existence of a periodic solution in the system, okay? So then for that, in order to do that, so Nelson, then we do what? Okay, so but then what, how, how can we ensure that there is a periodic solution? Uh, Michael. Um, to ensure that we have one, we just need to satisfy the conditions of the theorem. Exactly. The conditions of the theorem are that there exists a set D with certain properties, right? Okay, so let's, let's, keep, let, let's make an example of this um, <clears throat> to see how it works in practice. All right, so the dynamical system I'm gonna tell you about is, is this one. Okay, so this is a 2D system. Uh, this is the equation for you, this is the equation for B, and where g of u, in this case, we're going to set it to be equal to u to the 3 divided by 3 minus u. So how does g of u look like? Okay, essentially we're taking the function minus u to the 3, this function. Oh, you're right, sorry. Yeah. So we're taking the function u to the 3 over 3 like this, and we're subtracting something, right? So it becomes something like this. Okay, great. All right, 
So now uh, let's uh, look at the null clients of this system. Okay, what is a set of points such that u prime is equal to zero? Well, it's the same set of points such that v minus g of u is equal to zero. And that's the same as saying that v is equal to g of u. What is that set of points? It's the graph of G, right, exactly. What about the set of points such that V prime is equal to zero? Well, that's a set of points with the property that minus U is equal to zero or simply U is equal to zero. All right, so let's draw the null clients here. So this is u prime is equal to zero. And the null client v prime is equal to zero is right here. And by the way, this is u. And this is v. Okay, so v prime equal to zero means that the arrows are vertical or horizontal. Or actually, let's look at this one. If u prime is equal to zero, <laughs> okay. So the u component of the vector is equal to zero, right? The u component is the horizontal component, right? Vectors are vertical, that's right. Okay, and where are they pointing up and where are they pointing down? So let's evaluate at a certain point. Evaluate. Uh, what would be a point where, a point in the null plane, for example, over here? Well, actually, no, that's not even, that's not even in the null plane. So what is v equals u of u? No, it's u prime equal to zero is equivalent to saying v minus g of u is equal to zero. Right. Right? So v is equal to g of u. Yes. Okay. So you look at v as a function of u. What function is it? It's a function g of u. Yes, so there you go. Okay, all right. So uh, let's evaluate it at a point, let's say, over here. Um, one and, yeah, you're right. Okay. So v prime is equal to uh, minus u is equal to minus 1, less than 0. And u prime better be equal to 0, because that's how we're setting it up, right? So then it's vertical, or uh, uh, going up or going down? Yeah. Going down, OK, good. OK, what happens here? Switch, because we cross an old thing. Okay, what about on the green line? Let's evaluate it at the point. Let's say the point zero comma one. Okay, so B prime better be equal to zero because it's equal to minus u and uh, u is zero. 
and u prime is equal to one, one minus g of zero, which is equal to one, which is bigger than zero. Okay, so these arrows are horizontal, okay, and we can tell that here they're positive or negative? Positive. And here they're negative. Okay, awesome. All right, so now comes the part where we start to be hand wave a little bit. So, suppose that you start over here. What happens? You get up, you go up like this, right? And then you start moving towards the right. Yes. Okay. And if you move towards the right, at some point you're going to start moving down, right? So you do it like this. Once you cross this line, you have to go over this hump, right? This, these arrows going down are not going to let you go back to, into the hump, right? So you, you go all the way up across this hump and, and the whole thing repeats itself again, right? So the, intuitively the idea is that there is a periodic solution in the system that goes around like this, okay? What we're going to do more, more precisely is we're going to draw a um, a region like this okay and define D to be what's you know this given by this annular region okay now let's think are there any steady states in this system. What do you think, Abdon? Are there any steady states in the in, in this in the set D? So by the way, it's clear what D is. It's this 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 thing over here, right? This donut. Yeah. No, that's only on the inside and it's not part of D. That's right. The only the only steady states are the intersection of the two null planes. So that's right here. That's the only the only steady state of the system. So no steady states okay and now the idea is that the arrows are all pointing towards the inside of the set so if you look for example over here the arrows are pointing in the arrows here are pointing down the arrows here are pointing on towards the outside but if you look at here the arrows are actually pointing towards the inside now that is the part where you need to be very careful in constructing D Right, but as a you know, as in, in general, you can more or less see. I mean, it's not to me. It's actually not entirely clear why, but the idea is that if you set, if you construct the set D right, right, uh, then you can create it in such a way that the arrows are pointing towards the inside of the set, and it makes sense in a sense because if you start over here, let's say if you start over here, right, you're ultimately gonna go into the set, right, and if you start over here you're going to stay inside the set. So you're going to ultimately get out over the sump and then stay around, you know, on the, on the outside of the set. Of the set. Uh, I'm not entirely convinced by this argument. I, I, I would actually like to, um, to do this more formally. Last time that I tried to do this more formally, it turns out to be a harder problem than I thought. And I, I don't think that the, uh, the book goes over every detail. And I think that this is just an illustration. It is not supposed to be like a uh, too precise argument, okay? But the idea is that this set exists and that you can, you know, if you can prove this, then you can actually conclude from the theorem that there must be periodic solutions, okay? That would be one approach, is the approach using the annular region. Then let's think if we can do this with this type of set, a bounded region with a single repelling steady state. What do you think? Is that a more promising approach in this case? Maybe, right? Maybe we can, instead of doing this annular region here, we can construct some kind of square that includes this point over here. Okay? We would have to show that this point is actually a repelling point. How do we do that? You linearize, exactly. You linearize. We know that this point is some kind of spiral, right? I mean, you can tell here, this is like this, this is like that, right? 
So this point seems to have some kind of spiral behavior. So the eigenvalues are either both a negative real part or positive real part. We should be able to figure out from the linearization whether this steady state is repelling. And if it is repelling, then we can focus on just having a, a, a region that has a single steady state and that all the arrows are pointing in. All right, great. So there you go. Um, huh, we don't have a lot of time left. Uh, let me give you one more example. I w actually wanted to tell you about a different, slightly different thing. Okay, let me tell you one more thing, what, a, different, a different thing in the next five minutes. Okay, so suppose that you're interested in proving not that there is a periodic solution, but that there is not. You, you, you have a system in, your, in front of you and you think, uh, I don't think the system has a, has, has a periodic solution. How can I prove it? Okay, so question, can you prove that a system does not have a periodic solution. And this is called the Dulac criterion. Okay, D is, as before, a bounded, simply connected region. Simply connected means it has no holes. You might have heard about it from a previous course in analysis. Have you taken an analysis course? No? Okay, so simply connected, bounded and simply connected means that it has no holes, like a like a, like a ball or something like that. Not an, not an annulus region, but more like this. Um, and uh, you have a system, x prime equals f of xy, y prime equals f, sorry, g of xy, okay. Assume assume that for some function B from D into the reals, and this is a sorry, a C one function. Uh, it holds that this derivative plus this derivative is different from zero and does not change sign. Okay, so basically, for example, this, this whole thing is always positive or this thing is always negative. It does not change sign. Then, then there are no periodic orbits in D. Okay, 
So it's up to you to find the function b. You try different types of functions b, and every time you evaluate this thing, and uh, whenever you find, if you're able to find one that satisfies this condition, you can conclude that the system has no periodic solutions. And as an example, I can actually use this on the, on the uh, Lotka Volterra uh, system. Not the predator prey, which does very much have periodic solutions, but in the competition model, the Lotka Volterra competition model, which is of the form x prime equals r1x uh, times k1 minus x minus beta 1 y divided by k1 and y prime is equal to r2 y times k2 minus y minus beta 2y divided by k2. Okay, so now define the function b of xy equal to 1 over xy. You can define any function you want. Many functions will, will not work. If there's even just one function that works, you're good. So you take the function uh, x, sorry, b times f is the derivative with respect to x of um, yeah. of this minus x minus beta okay so when you multiply this thing by um, by b, you get rid of this x right here, and you end up with the y on the bottom. And what is this derivative? So notice that we're taking the derivative with respect to x. It's actually particularly easy, you see, because there's all these, like y's, for example, are treated as a constant. Okay, so the derivative with respect to x really only has one variable here. So this thing goes away, this thing goes away, essentially is R1x over K1y. Essentially, basically it's a constant times x, right? So the derivative of this is minus R1 over K1y. But remember, we're talking about a, a, lot of, a, a competition ecological model. So x and y are both assumed to be positive. We're looking at the positive quadrant, right? So this thing is negative. Okay, similarly, uh, similarly the derivative with respect to y of b g is equal to minus r2 over k2x is less than zero and so the sum of these two is less than zero and by the Dulac criterion no periodic solutions okay Sorry for running over. Uh, do you guys have any questions? All right. So there you go. Now we have a criterion for proving the existence of periodic solutions and a criterion to proving the non-existence of periodic solutions.
Good? Awesome. Okay.